The city is probably the oldest, most enduring invention of our civilization. The words are interchangeable. Civilization, civil, civic, city. Cities evolve over time. They respond to crises. And historically, they emerge from crises stronger than ever before. So what are the future trends for cities? And what are the lessons of history? My name is Teresa Williamson, and I'm Executive Director of Catalytic Communities. Uh, I'll be speaking today about valuing informality, designing for global development, uh, how we can value informal settlements, favelas around the world, and integrate them on their own terms into our urban planning practices. Uh, so um, before we begin, I just want to mention Catalytic Communities, our NGO. We've been working for 20 years providing strategic support to favela organizers. So everything I present today is going to be drawing on that experience. Um, and, you know, just to start off, it's really important to be aware of the global reality that we're uh, talking about. So informal settlements are not new and they're not rare. One in three people living in cities today lives in an informal settlement and 85% of all housing worldwide is built illegally. Um, by 2050, nearly a third of humanity will live in uh, urban informal settlements, according to the United Nations. So basically, we have an option. We can continue seeing these areas as a blight, as a problem to be addressed, or uh, which we know hasn't worked, or we can um, look at them through a new lens. We can recognize their role in providing for human needs, uh, value their contributions, and find ways to integrate them that build on their qualities. And I'll talk about these qualities today. So my goal today is to provide a framework through which we can shatter our current lens and learn to value informal settlements, and in this way, create truly inclusive, vibrant, resilient, and sustainable cities. I'll do this by introducing on-the-ground perspectives from Rio de Janeiro and its favelas, uh, some of the most stigmatized informal settlements in the world. And I believe this framework will be useful to reflect on any city anywhere, not only in the developing world. So starting off, just, uh, you know, uh, provides a background about Rio. Most people are familiar with the beautiful landscapes in the city when they see a picture of the city, but very few people are familiar with the history uh, that's underneath, that's underlying that landscape. Rio's port was actually uh, the largest slave port in the world, receiving five times more enslaved Africans than the entire US. This is a history few people even in Rio know about. Uh, slavery in Brazil lasted 60% longer than uh, in Brazil than in the United States. And this marks the way the city operates to this day. And it also marks the creation and establishment of the city's favelas. The very first favela, in fact, was settled less than 10 years after abolition. It's called today Providencia, but at the time it was just called Favela Hill. It was named after a resilient uh, plant that existed in the northeast of Brazil where soldiers who had served battle returned to Rio from that area. And when they weren't paid for their labor, they settled on this hillside and founded the first favela, or at least the first informal settlement in Brazil called Favela. And there are a number of elements that led to the formation and the founding of Rio's favelas in that period and why they're located on the hillsides. Um, rural land wasn't available. Brazil experienced very early urbanization. Rio was the capital of the country, so people, that's where they came. Uh, and there was no affordable housing. And so people occupied the central hillsides, which were marked for conservation. So they were public land. They were fairly easy targets for occupation. Now, since then, we can basically trace 123 years of policies towards these communities uh, through a very simple lens. The primary policies, and, and these are policies, they're intentional, are of neglect and repression. Uh, and unfortunately, this has marked the legacy. There have been brief periods of government investment in these areas, which are significant, but really, ultimately, the primary uh, the primary policy has been neglect and repression. Meanwhile, residents build and rebuild and rebuild 
their communities. And so over 123 years, we've actually had the expansion to 1,000 of these communities across the city of Rio. And today they house 22 to 24 percent of the city's population. And today you can look at racial maps of the city and you can still see that legacy tracing back to abolition over the territory of the city where favelas are primarily black and brown communities and the wealthy parts of the city are primarily white. And favelas are all over the city. So you can look at views, whatever neighborhood you're in, and you're going to see favelas on the landscape. They're truly located everywhere. And so when we stop to just take a moment and look at all the favelas across the city and think about what do they all actually have in common, uh, it's four elements. And none of them are objectively good or bad. They're simply neighborhoods that develop as a solution for the unmet need for affordable housing. There's no outside regulation, so they build themselves on their own accord, right, uh, by residents for residents, and they constantly evolve all the time based on culture, access to resources, jobs, the city, what kind of geography they're on. And so even though the dominant global press continues to call them shanties or shacks or slums or squatters, the truth is these communities are typically nowadays generations old and they're no longer characterized by those conditions of slums or shanties. Over time, they actually become consolidated uh, where the building stock, access to services, community ties, and way of life become firmly established, even while tenure and some services continue limited. So while they're born of neglect, at their core, favelas are solutions factories. First, they address the need for shelter, but then they go well beyond that basic need. So just to emphasize shelter a bit, uh, for sev several decades, we've been building economies, right? Thinking of housing as property, as our primary way of viewing the housing sector. Well, when we look at Maslow's hierarchy of needs, basic human needs, right? It's very clear that shelter is there, but also property is not on the same rung. Shelter is a basic need, property is not. These are two different elements. These are two different needs. Uh, and one of them is primary, that's shelter. Um, and so unfortunately we've been building cities and building our housing systems, uh, thinking of, of housing as a property, as a uh, speculative good, as an investment, rather than uh, for its basic service, which is shelter. Uh, and there's this 20% rule in housing. And basically, it's just simple. 20% of the population of any city cannot afford market rate housing. It's just because of the nature of housing, because of the, the costs associated with land and construction, uh, the market won't provide housing to the lowest income residents of any city. And so since we're talking about a very basic need that's being met primarily through housing, uh, we have to find ways of addressing that need. In developed contexts, typically, uh, but not always, there are plenty of tent cities in American cities, for example, uh, but in developed contexts, typically it's through public sector housing, social rent, different kinds of regulations and subsidies. Uh, it can also be nonprofits through cooperatives, community land trusts. But in the uh, developing world, that need is met through informal settlements. So informal settlements are basically just there to provide for this basic need of shelter. That's their primary uh, function. And it's not a coincidence that 22 to 24 percent of Rio's population lives in these sorts of environments. Now, as an urban planner, I've come to appreciate a host of qualities that these communities have uh, as they develop, that they, they, they sort of naturally develop. Um, in Rio's case, they're in central areas, they're affordable housing throughout the city's landscape, uh, that's responsive architecture that's built around need. Um, there's low social isolation due to the built environment and other factors. They're pedestrian centered, they're uh, in the absence of organized crime and, and, and other pressures, they're actually quite safe for kids because there are no cars, no strangers around. You know, they have employment nearby, support networks, cultural incubation. So there's a number of qualities that we're trying to build into cities that favelas uh, have. And at the same time, you know, you can dig into any of these. You can talk about the entrepreneurship, the economy. A 2014 study before the current economic recession found that favela wages had actually increased more than the national average. 
and that favelas had more middle class residents than Brazil as a whole. It also found that 94% of favela residents at the time felt that they were happy, considered themselves happy, and 66% wouldn't leave their communities and 62% were proud to live there. Uh, there have been comparisons of favelas by architects to lead neighborhood development sites to find that there actually can be more sustainable on those terms. Um, there's a favela in Rio that has developed its own sewage system to address the, the sanitation issue uh, in the absence of government investment. Um, there's a whole network of favelas working towards sustainable development in Rio called the Sustainable Favela Network, which our organization manages. Uh, there are communities that have done massive cleanup operations. In this case, in Vigigao, a uh, community park was built on a site where there had been 14 tons of garbage uh, that was cleaned up by residents. Cultural production, think about culture coming out of Brazil. The vast majority of culture associated with Rio comes from or is developed in and strengthened and maintained in the city's favelas. And there are now 26 favela museums and memory projects across Rio. So this just goes to show the, the, the history these communities have now established uh, and their desire to preserve that history and build on that history. Now, if we take a moment to look at favelas and compare favelas to the formal city of Rio, we find that actually informality is not the absence of formality. And this is really important to note because governments often come in and say, we're gonna formalize the informal. We're gonna bring in the formal services. Uh, but it's important for us to know that these are actually different ways of life and there are some qualities in each and we need to make informed decisions and communities in particular need to make informed decisions about what elements they want to include. This is especially important in established consolidated informal settlements where people have over generations established a way of life that has much value. Uh, often it's immaterial value. And so it's not quantified, but it must be recognized. So um, when we choose these, right, we have, or when we look at these two, uh, we can compare, for example, that the formal city is limited in complexity because it's regulated. The informal city grows in complexity over time. Uh, there's centralized planning in the formal city, whereas in the informal city, it's iterative planning. Um, services are monetized in the formal city, whereas they're demonetized often in the informal city, which allows people who are of low income to improve their circumstances. Um, there's a logic of privacy in the formal city, whereas there's a logic of proximity and mutual aid in the informal city. And so these are all differences uh, that can be attributed and we need to be aware of them as we make decisions. And regarding the complexity element, uh, just taking a moment to look at that a little more deeply. So over time, these communities become increasingly complex and complexity can actually be a hallmark of resiliency. So if we think about natural systems, right, this is um, an image from Dra David Krakauer of the Santa Fe Institute that studies complexity, uh, you know, showing that in natural systems, as you increase randomness, um, you know, different uh, elements, increasing elements, you actually get systems like an ecosystem that are incredibly diverse and resilient, um, that are of great value. You're characterized by growing, growing complexity. However, you can get to a point where there's too much uh, chaos essentially in the system. So I took the liberty of applying his same slide and the same concept to human settlements just to uh, provoke this question about what kinds of neighborhoods and human environments might have that sort of sweet spot of complexity. So could it be that those favelas that reach a sweet spot of complexity and are the, then able to solidify their qualities without escalating into some sort of dysfunction can hold the keys to vibrant and sustainable urbanization? What can we learn from these communities, um, even for cities in the developed world? So I'm gonna show now some images of favelas in different levels of development, different environments across the city, different amounts of investment by government or lack of investment by government, um, levels of public services, uh, and also very clearly always the community life and the nuanced and, and diverse types of architecture uh, that can arise. This final slide says favela residents are not at fault. <laughs> 
So favelas whose residents take advantage of the qualities of informality, realizing their own creative improvements, but also fight for access to services and rights, appear to make the greatest inroads over time. This image now is of Providencia today, the first favela founded 123 years ago. This is a boy whose painting was uh, painted, produced on the wall of a house in the community. Now that community was uh, one that was targeted for evictions uh, nearly a decade ago. And a community photographer, he took photographs of residents and he plastered them on the walls of their homes that were marked for eviction. And he actually was able, they were able to stop the process of evictions in that section of the community through this public act. Now I'd like to talk a little bit about different kinds of development, how government views informal settlements or low income neighborhoods anywhere really in the world versus how we could look at them differently and actually produce the kinds of changes and improvements that support residents and allow them to better their lives while recognizing and building on everything that they have achieved. Uh, so typical government programs, for example, they think about community deficiencies, but what's called asset-based community development or ABCD looks at community assets. So community assets are actually a springboard from which you address the deficiencies, the issues, the challenges. So rather than looking at informal settlements or low-income communities as places deserving of charity or a favor, uh, we look at them as places uh, with the right to investment and the right to basic services. Um, rather than experts coming in with their knowledge, uh, we actually see communities as the experts. And we think of technical allies, people who come from outside and provide different types of technical support to local organizers. And so you can go down this list and you can understand that actually the way we do development typically is very different from the way the communities actually need and that build on their qualities. And the big problem is if we don't learn to build on communities' qualities, then we lose them in the process of development. So we see this very clearly in the pre-Olympic buildup in Rio. Um, Villa Autodromo is a community that was evicted uh, in the period preceding the Olympics almost entirely. Um, you can see an image of the community as it stood. It was fairly consolidated. It was safe. Uh, the roads were wide. It wouldn't have been difficult to upgrade and improve and, and essentially finalize, bring it up to standard. However, the city decided to evict residents, in some cases forcefully, and in the end, a few residents, 20 families, were able to stay in a community originally of 700 at a huge cost to the city. Um, and this is a community where, because we don't see favelas for their assets, we wiped out an entire neighborhood that had young people going to university, strong networks of solidarity, people near their jobs, kids in school, uh, you know, basically it was a very well-functioning favela. Uh, this next slide shows what was happening at the time. Besides Villa Autodromo, 80,000 people were evicted from their homes across primarily consolidated favelas. Um, and that's again, because we don't see the qualities in these communities, so we wipe them out. And this image also shows the uh, gentrification that was happening in the pre-Olympic per period. So we actually had two pressure points for these communities. We had government evicting some, and we had the speculative market evicting others. And so I asked the question, if favelas are all bad, then why do you see processes of gentrification? Why were middle-class people buying homes in some favelas and feeling comfortable doing so? Why were uh, outside investors buying up areas at the top of favelas where people had to go all the way through the community to access a hotel or a bar. Um, so these communities are not, it's very problematic the fact that we don't look at them individually and we don't get close and we don't take the time to understand what they have going for them and build from there. Uh, one way to realize the potential of consolidated favelas is through, um, through an asset-based community development approach is the Favela Community Land Trust. So we have taken in Rio as our model, the case of the Caño Martín Peña in Puerto Rico. Uh, this is a place where a, a set of eight favelas, informal settlements, where they opted for uh, titling the land collectively through a community land trust and individually giving homeowners ownership of their homes. And this has allowed the community to formalize 
in a way that maintains community assets because communities can continue to improve um, collectively. They can build the, maintain the solidarity networks. Uh, they can, um, uh, they are con in control of their development, but also gives people uh, the right to stay. It ensures that people can stay, that they have control over their homes. It's a very pragmatic solution that enables favela residents to establish themselves formally while maintaining their autonomy and the qualities established through informality. Uh, so favela CLTs put an end to forced displacement, whether by government or speculative development, and they empower communities to make improvements as collective landowners, whether on their own or through advocacy for public investment. So in conclusion, let's drop the double standards. Uh, we talk about tactical urbanism, uh, but what about when low-income people do tactical urbanism? Informal settlements are essentially immense examples of tactical urbanism. It's trendy when the elite in the global north do it, but when people do this uh, in the global south in, or in areas uh, of, of, of resource scarcity, we treat it differently. Same thing with the idea of maker spaces or hacking. Um, and then, of course, there's the new trend of dangerous playgrounds uh, where you know, people think it's good to let their kids have more uh, less structured experiences on the playground. Um, and yet, in a favela environment, I often am asked when I take visitors, oh, are these kids safe? Gosh, they're running around by themselves. Well, they know everybody. There are no cars. Uh, so I think we need to really recalibrate the way we think about these communities. Look at Habitat 67, for example. Uh, it's known for its interlocking forms, connected walkways and landscape terraces, uh, right? And this idea of density. Well, what does it look like? It looks like a favela. Or as my daughter said, it's a fake favela without culture and color. <laughs> so it's this idea of why do we appropriate why do we appropriate images? Why do we uh, look at different communities, at these communities through one lens, and then look at others through a different lens? Valparaíso and many UNESCO World Heritage Sites, uh, they're commended for their vernacular urban fabric adapted to the hillsides, or the, fight, the, the fact that their site's based on improvised urban design and unique architecture. Uh, why aren't favelas uh, recognized for their qualities? So these are two images of a favela in Rio and Santonini, and the same in this picture. So the question really is, what if we recalibrate, think differently, and approach these sorts of settlements in a totally different way? What if Rio embraced the unique history of each of the city's favelas, recognized their contribution to the city, and supported their future development in ways that honored resident knowledge and history? What if we invested in decentralized planning where communities control their destiny and technical allies support their vision? And finally, what if Rio set an example for the world, realizing community-led integration rooted in community assets and benefiting from the qualities of informality? We need this leadership because a third of the world's population is going to be living in informal settlements by 2050. And if we don't think differently about these communities and embrace them for what they're actually providing uh, and build from there, we're gonna be losing uh, incredible potential and really digging our own graves collectively. Uh, so we need to think differently, both in terms of uh, how we approach these communities, uh, but also just the truth. Uh, where, why do they surface? Why do they exist? They're basically responding to a challenge. They are solutions. And so uh, I just leave you with that idea. And I welcome contact from everyone who's watching this masterclass. My email is here. The presentation link is at the bottom. And again, I thank the Norman Foster Foundation for this wonderful opportunity. Mm -hmm.